Stefan described men who held their emotions and problems for themselves as ghosts. He said that once he was one, because it was the only way to deal with his childhood. He also said that being a ghost will destroy you in the long run. And so my question is, how does a person break out of being a ghost and start to fully live again? That's from Gustav. Well, hey, Gustav, how you doing? Hello, Stefan. Do you hear me? I can. How you doing? Uh, I'm fine. Um... You sound startled. Well, how, how, how to begin? Um... That's up to you. Well, um, well, it, it, it's interesting that you talked about uh, people not being happy, uh, like some minutes ago. Uh, yep. Well, in my my case, I think it began when I was like twelve, and uh, basically slowly escalate escalated but it's always in waves at, and it doesn't seem to um, it doesn't seem sorry do you mean your unhappiness began at that time yeah it began at that time um, because I, I was bullied um, for a year but then uh, after that I was never bullied but uh, after that I always for some reason, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly why, um, but I just had a difficult time to connect with people. Uh, I think it's because uh, I think it's because um, when I was bullied, uh, okay, it was like this. Um, we had a but it was two classes in. Uh, we, 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 which we shared, uh, we did a sports together with another class. And when we, we were about to shower, uh, the showers, it's like a metal uh, uh, casket, or what do you say, that is stuck to the wall. Do you know it? Uh, do you know what I mean? Uh, yes. Yeah, so when always when I enter the shower, uh, the guys would uh, smash uh, the, the metal caskets and uh, shout my name, and kill, and then my name. Uh, so kill Gustav, kill Gustav, kill Gustav, when I s stood in the shower. So uh, my way to de deal with it was to always basically shut the system down when I went entered. And it feels like I carry. I have carried it with me ever since, and I've never carried talked what? to anyone about it except for a friend, uh, just a week ago. Uh, right. And I never but what shared have you, it. You said you carried. Sorry, sorry, Gustav. You said you'd carried it with you, but what have you carried with you? Well, th that uh, the it's the shutting down. Uh, like I don't. Uh, I try to repress my. Feelings never be vulnerable. Um, you understand? Um, I do. Were your friends or your former friends involved in this kind of teasing, or was it kids no, you didn't know? No, it was the other class we, which we did the sports together with. So it was no, never them, but we they never said anything. I never talked about it with them. It was like it, we ignored it. And I never told my parents because... I didn't want to hurt them because I had a I have a brother which also also was bullied, and uh, I didn't want them to feel pain. You didn't want your parents to feel pain. Yeah. Do you think that they would feel pain if they had known that you had been bullied but hadn't talked to them about it? Yes. So it wasn't. So well, your when, story when about you that, why you were when you're that age, you will you don't think like that. Uh, I would no, no, no. Don't don't yourself. give me the age. No, no, no. Listen, Gustav. There are children who are not bullied, 
because if those children are bullied, they will go to their parents and their parents will go to the teacher and their parents will raise holy hell until the bullies are dealt with and their parents will go over to the bully's parents' house and those kids don't get bullied. So the fact is that you radiated, I would imagine, you radiated a sense of parental detachment, right? Yeah. It is the I younger, have... weaker zebras who are separated from the herd who are eaten first mm -hmm. by the lions. Mm -hmm. And so the bullies would have instinctually known, would have instinctually known that you would not tell your parents and that's why they bullied you. Yeah. So the separation of intimacy and contact with your parents came before and probably caused the bullying because the bullies are experts at knowing which child is separated emotionally from the parents and that's who they pounce on. Mm -hmm. And I think that was that's because my other my brother had had so much problems in school and uh, in life that uh, but that's that's part uh, of the same thing because your brother yeah but he, he he was not ignored they all they knew all about his problems and uh, uh, and what did they do to solve his problems not very much because they didn't succeed <laughs> Well, I remember what, 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 hang on, like, you were part of the family. What practical steps did your parents take to deal with the issue of bullying of your brother? Uh, older brother, I assume. No, younger. Oh, younger? Mm -hmm. And he was bullied before you were bullied? Yeah, uh, exactly. And did he, uh, sorry, did he go to the same school? Yes, but, well, that was okay, another so, school, so, sorry, that was the next school, that was, no, I was but, bullied so in the next bullies... school, uh, when he, he didn't attend that school, when I was bullied in that school, it was the, the second level. Well, word gets around, so if you have two siblings, and one sibling is being bullied successfully, everybody knows that the other sibling can also be bullied successfully, because they both share the same parents, and the ineffectiveness of the parents in dealing with the bullying is transmitted among the bullies, mm -hmm. um, usually very quickly, even if they're at separate schools, the bullies say, oh, well, we can bully this kid, so we can bully his brother too, because they have the same parents. Yeah, I, uh, but I can't find the, the connection between the people who uh, bullied my brother. To, to In the age of social media, you probably won't be able to. So what did your parents do about your brother being bullied? Uh, I think they talk to the teachers to some extent, but uh, I don't think they, they actually solve the problem. Uh, and I, I, I knew uh, they weren't happy with it, all the problems with my brother. And I, I remember actually when uh, when I was like four years old and my brother began at the kindergarten, um, he because my mother had then uh, began began to work again, and he, he was like she, every time she dropped him off uh, to the kindergarten, she, he had like a thirty minute struggle because of resistance to get to his to get to our mother. Our mother. He didn't want to be abandoned he by his parents. He didn't want to be abandoned by our right, mother. Right, of course. And your mother For 30 went minutes, ahead and, and did I it anyway. I remember anymore. looking at it um, for when I was four. Every right. day, like every day. And um, why did your mother want to go to work rather than raise her children? <laughs> well, it's Sweden. It's, uh, and she, she is very successful at work. Very That's successful. not what I asked. And neither of those is an answer. Yeah. Your mother is a human being with choices, not a flag, right? So why did she choose to go to work rather than raise her children? She looks down on it, I think, to, be, to not work as a woman. She looks down on parenting, like parenting is what idiots do, but dropping your screaming child off at daycare is what strong and intelligent and brave women do who are mothers, is that right? Well, uh, the reason I say it is because I, 
another person, which uh, also uh, she's a civil engineer, uh, and another woman who attended the uh, attended uh, the education with her. She decided to be a, a full time home mom, mom for her own life, and uh, my mother was very negative about it when she talks about it. That's well, hang hang on a sec, Gustav. I got I got to pause you for a sec. Sorry to interrupt. So you said originally, you said that your mother went back to work rather than being a mother because it's Sweden, right? I, in other words, that's what all the women do, right? Yeah. But your mother had a friend who stayed home. So clearly that's not what all women do. And your mother had an example in her own social circle of a woman who stayed home. Mm. Yeah, but she disapproved of it. Yeah. So it's not, yeah, of course. And what did she say about her friend who stayed home? Even though she didn't say it explicitly, but you could uh, feel that she uh, looked down upon it because uh, it was unworthy, especially because she had uh, taken an education at the highest level before she she became a uh, mother uh, at home, stay at home mother. So it was, in your mother's view, beneath the woman's capacities to raise yeah, children when beneath, she could have been beneath her capacity, and that's why. Right. So being a mother is a job for retarded people, for people of low intellectual capacity. It's sort of like being a garbage collector or um, a street sweeper or something like it's for idiots to do and your mother's intellect is too lofty and powerful uh, to to lower itself to the mere raising of her own children is that right well it's very difficult to say that about my mother because i still uh, there's a lot of positive things about her so i, I wouldn't use those uh, words uh, all right how would you uh, how would you phrase it Well, let me help you out know. a bit. So, so your, mo your mother would view me as a loser because I gave up an entrepreneurial career at the highest levels of the software industry in order to be a stay-at-home dad. So she would view me as a loser who was vastly underutilizing his wondrous capacity, right? At, yeah, at least uh, she would say you are uh, not using you, your full capacity, yes. And... Uh, and she, uh, so, she's, so to I, some you know, extent, also would say that uh, she. I don't think she can. I don't think she actually believed the. The, her friend, actually wanted it, but somehow, it's like. Uh, doing it anyways, like not under. She like she didn't even. My mother ca could not even understand why, uh, she would do it. Uh, you understand. Right, because uh, only an, a mouth-breathing idiot would stay home with children. In, in other words, if you have any intellectual capacity, you wouldn't want to waste it on your own children. You would want to set it to work. Uh, what fields did your mother work in, or does your mother work in? Um, well, it's well, she's very successful. It's in uh, in in the, in the industry, industrial uh, industries. So she has been. Uh, Develop director of development and uh, and such at uh, high tech companies. Okay, so I mean, I've I've had that job, so I understand that job very well. So she is producing or helping to produce software for people to consume, which is usually obsolete within a year or two. But that's been her big contribution to society: is to avoid being around her own children, but instead serve software up to customers that becomes obsolete within a year or two. Yeah, and also she has been uh, worked at as chief operating officer. Yep. Yep. All right. So I guess my question is why why would she want to have children? 
if she wants to work rather than be a mother, why would she want to have children? Well, I, uh, she loves us, I think. She, she's a very... I think? Well, I know. <laughs> she loves us. Um, okay. Why she would want to have children? Well, it's, isn't that a mom, mom, uh, an instinct? No, that's not the maternal Maybe. instinct. But the, no, the, you can't. You can't you, you're giving all these excuses that are environmental, Gustav. I mean, well, she's Swedish, therefore she... And I'm like, no, 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 no. She has a friend who stays home. Well, there's a maternal instinct. No, that's like some guy who sleeps around on his wife saying, well, men like variety. It's instinctual. It's like, nope. You all have a choice, right? You're not giving your mother moral agency. And for a... I assume a woman who wants egalitarianism for women who's probably a feminist, a woman who would not say that you should hold women to a lower standard, should she not have moral agency in what she did? Yes. Okay, so then stop giving her the excuse of environment and instinct, and she made particular choices. She's intelligent enough to do what she does in the world, so she's intelligent enough to be aware that she's making choices, and all you're making, all she made is choices, and all you're making are excuses. Yes, to some... Um well, because I know her so well, uh, I see I'm, I'm, uh, the pic my picture is more, uh, what, what do you say, um, there are so many layers and so much, uh, it's like you, you can't, your description of her is so, uh, for me it, 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 it is, it becomes simplistic, and that's why I defend her because it's one side of it, of the coin, um, while the other side. Uh, no, that's look, that that's entirely your interpretation. If I say your mom went to Atlanta, like it, let's say your mom last weekend went to Atlanta, and I say, "Oh, your mom went to Atlanta," would you immediately say, "Oh no, she's been to a whole bunch of other places. She hasn't only been to Atlanta. She's not just one person who one time went to Atlanta, and that's all she is." You understand, that's a defensive reaction to a simple statement of fact that your mom went to Atlanta. Mm. Yeah, okay. You understand? Yes, yes. Okay, so stop with the defensive crap because that's how you avoid your feelings. Mm. I didn't say all your mother is is this. What I'm saying is this is what I see on the most relevant aspect of what you told me about your mother. But when I say she went to Atlanta, I'm not saying she never went anywhere else. I'm just saying she went to Atlanta. The defensiveness is your response to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I agree. Because what I've heard is your mother has contempt for stay-at-home mothers. Your mother feels that it's a job that's far beneath her lofty intellect. And your mother dropped off a screaming little boy mm -hmm. at a daycare. And he spent 30 minutes trying to get her, begging her to stay, and she left anyway. And the other thing that I've heard, Gustav, is she failed to protect your brother and you from being bullied. Yes. Surely if she has this lofty, powerful intellect, I have no reason to disbelieve you when you say that, if she can be a COO and if she can be a director of this, that, and the other, then surely she can figure out how to protect her kids from bullies. I mean, because that's a mom's job. And remember, moms are idiots. It takes like 2% of her brain power to be a mom, so she wouldn't want to lower herself to that. But one thing moms are pretty good at is protecting their children from being bullied. So if your mom's so smart and parenting is so retarded, why couldn't she do a basic job of parenting and protect you from being bullied? Mm -hmm. But it was my decision to uh, not tell her. Uh, and. Why would I do that? But if you have, if you why, have why, so, why would hang, I on, hang on, hang on, hang on. If you have so much respect for your mother, then why would you not tell her when you were in pain? When you were scared, when you were going through a year of emotionally scarring abuse that hurts you deeply to this day. 
why wouldn't you tell? You say, well, I didn't want to cause her pain. But that is mothering your mother like she's an infant. Like you don't tell kids that daddy lost his job because they're four and they can't comprehend it. You're treating your mother as some kind of infant in that situation. You're working to try and protect her when her damn job is to protect you. So you, you, on the one side, Gustav, you give me this portrayal of your mother as this uber Randian hero who's able to leap tall intellectual mountains with a single bound. But on the other hand, she's like an infant that you have to protect her from any negative experiences you're having because you don't want her to have any like pain. Like you understand these two visions of your mother are antithetical. If your mother is a big, strong, powerful intellect, then telling her you're being bullied because she loves you and cares about you and wants you to be safe telling her you're being bullied should be at about as difficult as asking her what two and two make in math. Mm. So my question is, why didn't you tell her? Because I, because I saw that uh, they didn't succeed in helping my brother. So I figured the only thing I will achieve by telling them is causing them pain because they can't help me. All right. Why didn't they succeed with your brother? Because remember, parenting is because for idiots. Because they're not aggressive enough. Um, oh, no. Well, if I, Listen, if I, I'll tell you this. Oh, no, 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 no. Gustav, I tell you this. I have been an, an executive at software companies. Nobody gets to the top who's not aggressive. I'm telling you that right now, <laughs> without a doubt. Especially if she's female, if there's any residual skepticism about that. So there's absolutely no doubt that your mother is aggressive. That you cannot get past me. Okay. Well, my, well, my father is very, absolutely not aggressive. Um, I'm talking about your mother. No, no. Now you're switching topics because you don't <laughs> like where it's going. So let's go back to your mother. Why didn't you, why was your mother not able to deal with a very simple parenting task called protecting your children from bullies? Well, I, I don't I don't know exactly how they did uh, how they handled the situation with, with my brother. I only know that they failed. Uh, okay, why did they accept failure in this arguably more important task than getting the next version of the software out or getting the next promotion? Why did they fail to protect their children from emotionally damaging and scarring bullies? Because you do things till they work. You do like Parenting is like a marathon. And if you're training for a marathon, you don't go out once and say, well, I didn't do the 26.2 miles or whatever it is, so I'm just going to give up. You, do, you, you try things till they work. You do things till they work. You don't take no for an answer. You don't just give up. You don't just abandon your children to bullies. You keep working at the problem until you solve it. And that's how your mother became successful as an executive. She didn't just say, well, I tried one thing one time or I tried two things three times and they just didn't work. So I just gave up and we're not going to release the software. I mean, if she tried that in her business life, what would have happened? Fired? Yeah, she'd have been fired. Or she at least would have been demoted or at least she wouldn't have got the next promotion. Because at work, you succeed by doing it till it works. You know, how many takes do I have to make of certain of my videos? It's insane. I do it till it's right. Mm. You do it till, you, till, it, till it works. So your mom had a problem. My kids are being bullied. She's already said that parenting is what idiots do, basically. So mm. if she can't solve a problem that idiots do, how smart is she? Or does she just not care enough to pursue the solution to the problem until it works? Now, she's willing to do that at work for anonymous customers who she'll never, ever interact with again, probably certainly not after she retires. So she's willing to do something till it works for anonymous customers in the business world, but her own flesh and blood who are being traumatized, emotionally scarred, possibly for life. Does she just try? I made a couple of phone calls and then I gave up. Come on. Come on, you, you can't expect me to take that at all seriously. Yeah, they probably ignored it to some extent. Okay, so why? 
That's the question. This is the, I mean, if you want to know how you get your feelings back, in my opinion, this is how. You have to answer this question. Because you were, and your brother were, abandoned to bullies, unprotected, unhelped by your parents, whose job it is to keep you safe. That's the job. Mm. And they failed at their job. And you're scarred, and your brother is scarred as a result. So, why did they fail at their job of keeping you safe? They didn't have the will to do it. And even, no, you, you, you're just giving me, an, you're giving me synonyms. Why did they do it? Because they didn't do it. That's tautological. That answers nothing. Well, the, uh, okay. They have will because they've succeeded in their careers, or at least your mother does. Mm -hmm. Your mother has will. She has drive. She has ambition. She has tenacity. She continues to work at problems. She probably worked all night sometimes. She probably worked all weekend sometimes for vanity, promotions, money, and strangers. How about her own flesh and blood? See, parenting is so easy. So it should be far easier to solve a parenting or family or child problem like bullying than it is to do this lofty intellectual work she's doing for corporations. Why didn't she make it her number one priority to solve the problem with bullying of her children, which was emotionally scarring them possibly for life? Why was it not a priority? Too painful? Are you asking me or telling me? I don't know because I, well, I don't know your mom. That could be it. Does your mother have no capacity to overcome obstacles? I mean, when she's tired, does she just say, well, I'm not going to work. I don't feel like it. When she doesn't feel like doing something, does she just not do it? Um. No, she does it. Of course she does. I know that because she got to the top of her profession and getting to the top of your profession means pushing through when you don't feel like doing something. You know, I've, I've had to do shows with headaches and lights in my eyes when I'm exhausted. I've had to do speeches on no sleep. I mean, you just get up and do it because it's a priority. So the idea that it was too painful or she didn't feel like it or didn't want to or there was some negative experience doing it, eh, not the answer because she did it in her career. If she had no capacity to do that anywhere, maybe that would be the beginning of an answer, but it's not even close because she overcame her obstacles in her career. She just didn't do it to protect her children. Why? Do you know the answer or is it, are you just waiting for me to... Yes, I know the answer. <laughs> okay, you know the answer. That's good. Um, Do you want the answer? Yes. Because she didn't care. Didn't care enough. Wasn't a priority. Because her customers would cause her trouble and her bosses would get upset with her and her customers and her bosses have power over her because she's ambitious. So they have the choice to say yes or no to her, to keep her on or to fire her, to promote her or to not, to give her a bonus or not. So because they have power over her, mm -hmm. she makes their needs a very high priority. Do you understand? Yes. Now, you and your brother, do you have power over your mother? Can you inflict negative consequences on her in the way that her bosses and her customers can? Of course not. In, not in that. Of course not. Of course not. So you couldn't impact her life negatively, so you get no priority. She saves all of her high priorities to people who can impact her negatively, like her bosses and customers. Customers complain and bosses can fire you. Mm -hmm. So you weren't a priority. She didn't care. Because she would suffer no negative consequences from you being bullied. But she could suffer negative consequences from failing to deliver at work. So they get her attention. They get her priority. They get her willpower. They get her tenacity. And you get nothing. Yeah. And today, At least at this instance. And today the only thing I can talk to about to about 
with Amanda's work, her work. So there's the next question work. is, the next question is. That's the only thing you talk about. Of course, of course. I understand. So the next question, Gustav, and I appreciate you hanging in there, and this is tough, I know. But the next question is, why did she suffer no negative emotional consequences knowing that her children were being bullied? Well, in my case, uh, she, did it, she doesn't even know. Oh, my God, Gustav. Oh, my God. <laughs> you are a handful, you know that? Well, You are a handful, which means that you are a tough person to have a conversation with, and I like that. <laughs> I do, because it makes me work, and I never want to be um, going through the motions in these conversations. Okay, Gustav, let me tell you something. Before you were bullied, were you relatively happy? Or happier? Yeah, I would say so. Um... Okay. So then you've got people chanting, kill Gustav, kill Gustav, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going through this bullying for a year. Gustav, do you think that being bullied had any effect on your emotions? Yes, I think I okay. said it in the beginning that... Um... I know, I know it does. And that was a rhetorical question. I just wanted to bring you up to speed with this line of reasoning. Now, do you think it would be possible for someone who wasn't you, but who loved and cared about you and knew you intimately, do you think it would be impossible, even if you hadn't told them what was happening, do you think it was, would have been possible for someone to know that something was wrong in your life? Um, yes, 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 yes. Okay, good, good. So someone who knows and loves you will know that your life is being turned into a big bucket of venomous misery by bullies because you're unhappy, because you're unresponsive, because you don't want to go to work, uh, school, because you're not sleeping, because you're not eating, because you're stressed, because you're pale, because you're unwell, because you're low energy, because you're lethargic, because you're depressed, because you're anxious, because you withdraw from socializing, because whatever. The signs of trauma in children are not hard to read. Mm -hmm. So when you keep saying, well, she didn't know, bullshit. A, it's her job to know. And B, if she knew and didn't ask, she's fully culpable. She's culpable either way. If she didn't even know, that you being bullied into a state of depression that's lasted somewhat to this day, if I understand you correctly, if, she, if your mother didn't know that your life was being impacted negatively by vicious verbal abuse for a year, I don't even know what to say. That, that is a level of disconnectedness from your children I can't even fathom. I, 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 I don't even know what to call that. Mm -hmm. That literally is like you getting an arm chopped off and saying, well, my mother never noticed. Come on, she's not a nurse. Now, if she knew that something was wrong but never asked you about it, because she doesn't care. Of course. I mean, if your child is being hurt and you can see that the child is being hurt and you don't even ask the child if anything is wrong, it's because you don't give a shit or it's inconvenient or the child has no power to inflict negative consequences, so you don't care. Or you don't Do you, you want to feel pain if she would... You don't want to what? She, if, if she sees that uh, you're feeling bad uh, and confronts it, she will also feel pain. But if she doesn't confront it, she can... Uh, the pain is at the least at a lower level. Do you understand what I mean? So if she ignores, if, so what? Hang on. What you're saying? What you're saying is that if she, what you're saying is that if she ignores you being hurt, it doesn't impact her negatively. Well, I'm saying that if if she would confront it and actually deal with it, it would be more painful. Right. Okay. Let, let's say that that's true. 
Let's say that that's true. So what she's choosing, is it your pain over her pain? She wants you to feel pain so she doesn't have to feel pain. She wants you, a child who's still in the process of developing, to go through a year of trauma and bullying and abuse, which has scarred him to this day. She wants you to go through all of that so she doesn't have to deal with the problem. Because the fact that she didn't want to feel any discomfort in finding out that you were bullied meant that you got to get bullied more and more and more. Yes. yes. Do you think that's good parenting? Well, It's, it's non- supposed to be it's children first. Sorry? It's non-parenting. It's what? Non, also not, not non-existent parenting. No, no, no. It's not. No, that's not true. It's anti-parenting. You see, if someone's drowning in a lake and there are lots of people all taking their clothes off to go and jump in and swim and save this guy, and I say to everyone, stand back. I am a bronze medal certified lifeguard. And I swim out to the guy and just watch him drown. Is that non-saving? No, that's anti-saving. Because you can't be a non-parent if you're a parent. Because it's your job and it's nobody else's job to keep your kids safe. That's your job. If I say, Gustav, give me this essential letter and I will mail it for you. And then I just set fire to it and burn it and don't tell you. That's worse than me just saying, I'm too busy, I can't do it, right? Because you think it's done, and I've taken on the responsibility of doing it, which means if I fail to do it, that's just, that's not not delivering your letter. That's preventing your letter from being delivered at all, right? Like if if you say deliver this letter and I say no, you can just go somewhere else and someone else can deliver the letter or you can do it yourself. It still gets done. But if I say I'm going to do it and then I don't do it, your letter never gets delivered. That's not not delivering the letter. That's anti-delivering the letter. Does that make sense? Mm Mm-hmm. It makes sense. So your mother does not have the option to not parent. She just preferred dealing with people at work and serving their needs than keeping her children safe from trauma. Mm. Choices. Is, she's a big girl. She's a smart woman. And these are the choices. She knew you were being bullied. She knew you were miserable or she knew you were miserable about something. She knew that she had failed to protect your brother. And she didn't ask the whole time. Because, listen, (laughs) how old were you when you were being bullied in this way? Twelve. Twelve, okay. So you are still like 15 years from brain adulthood. You're a toddler, basically, as far as brain development goes. So you're 12 years old. And I can tell you this, as a father, my daughter is very verbal, as you can imagine, but she cannot identify and articulate problems that she's having. Of course not, any more than she can do calculus. Hell, most adults can't even do that. That's why we're talking. (laughs) But as a 12-year-old, you are not able to identify and articulate the issues that you're having. Because what you're saying is, well, I never told her like it's your job to tell her. It's not your job to tell your mother the difficulties that you're having because you functionally can't do it at the age of 12. It's her job to realize that something's wrong, sit down with you, and talk with you until you can figure out what's happened. and she can Until she can figure out what's happened and then... Right? And that can be a lengthy conversation. It may be more than one conversation. But you keep having it. I know when my daughter's upset and I sit down with her and we talk about it until we figure out what's going on. It's not her job to, to plumb the depths of her soul and dredge up her issues and, and tell them to me neatly packaged. Hell, if she could do that, she'd be out in the world by now. Right? I mean, they're, they're children. She's a child. You were a kid. It's your mother's job, not yours to figure out what's wrong in your life, help you explain it, help you understand it. And it was her job to fix it. All on her, none on you. 
because you keep telling me, well, I didn't tell her. Like that was your job. It wasn't. It was her job. And she failed. Repeatedly. And she's failed every single day since, Gustav. Because every single day, she knows that you're not as happy as you were before you were bullied. Every single day, she knows that you're not talking about your feelings or not expressing your feelings. Every single day, she knows that. And every single day, all she wants to talk about is work. The failure stretches from that day to this, to tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, which creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, um, how, how do I... I use the word ghost, which I believe you, you use. You used that on earlier um, podcast. And how do you break out of being a ghost? You know what uh, struck me? No. no, sorry, that's a rhetorical question. What struck me, <laughs> Gustav, is that you're talking about ghosting, and ghost, ghost is what happens after you're dead, right? And what did, the, what did the boys chant at you at school? Kill. Kill. Kill, Gustav, kill. But now you're talking about being a ghost. In other words, they did. Yeah, one part of me. Uh, right. At least buried some, uh, in me. It comes out uh, sometimes. It, co it came out two days ago. Uh, but. And I want that part. Of course, they didn't kill you, right? I mean, but you know what ghosts do, according to legend? What ghosts do, Gustav, is they hang around and haunt the scene of the crime until the criminal is apprehended. You've heard that story, right? Yeah. And that's what I'm talking about and have been talking about with you the whole time we're talking. That the ghost is hanging around the scene of the crime until the criminal is identified. Okay. So confronting uh, my mom. Or do you mean the bullies? I view the bullies while tragic and nasty. I view the bullies as a symptom. You know, if, if the elephant breaks its leg, the jackals will come. But the jackals are a symptom of the broken leg. Because the jackals cannot take down an elephant in its prime. All they'll become is jackal squish between the giant gray toes, right? Yeah. It's the lack of connection between you and your mother, in my opinion. It's a lack of connection between you, you and your mother that brought the bullies on. And what the bullies did was they exposed the lack of connection between you and your mother. And like all good little boys, you viewed the lack of connection between you and your mother as your fault. And this is why when I point out your mother's moral agency as an adult who chose to have children who's very smart by her own standards and should be very, it should be very easy for her to deal with the brain-dead operations known as mere parenting. Mm. I'm pointing out repeatedly against your resistance, which is your mother, right? You, you haven't yet shown up much in the conversation. All I'm doing is talking to your mother. But I'm merely pointing out that to be a feminist means, at the very least, to treat women as equal to men and men as equal to women. And this is why I do not withdraw moral agency for women and I do not make excuses for women and I treat them as full moral agents just like they wanted. Right? Women all want to be treated as equals. They want to be full moral agents, full responsibility, full moral agency. Well, welcome to what full moral agency looks like. Ladies, and if you don't like it, too bad. It's too late to go back. So, it wasn't your fault that you were bullied. 
it was your mother's fault. And again, we could talk about your dad, but we're just really focusing on your mom because she's the one who came up. It's your mother's fault. She failed you. She failed you because of her own selfish preferences, because of her own avoidance of that which is uncomfortable. Yeah, of course it's uncomfortable. Of course it's uncomfortable to deal with things that are uncomfortable. I get that. So what? So what? It's uncomfortable to be told you're an evil, sexist patriarch your whole damn life. Nobody gives a shit about men about that. So the fact that women are saying, well, it's uncomfortable. I don't care. I'll treat you the way you've treated me. That's the, I treat people the best I can. First time I meet them, after that, I treat them like they treat me. It's your mother's fault. Your mother made terrible, selfish, bad decisions. I'm not saying in her whole life, and I'm just talking about going to Atlanta. I'm just talking about this particular instance where she fails to protect her children from bullies. And her children are traumatized and have become a ghost, in your words, as a result. That is very, very bad parenting. That is a very, very terrible, selfish decision that has had multi-year, more than a decade of ramifications for you. And it's 100% her responsibility, 100% her decision, 100% her fault. None, nothing to do with you. The reason that you didn't go to your mother, Gustav, if you want the boldest truth I can provide, the reason you didn't go to your mother is you did not want to be exposed to how little she cared. You did not want to be exposed to how little a priority or how low a priority you were for her. You didn't want to go and beg her for help and have her wander off because she got an email. Because you did not want to have the lack of connection that you saw when she dropped off your screaming brother to daycare. You did not want to have that lack of connection exposed. The reason you didn't go to your mother was to protect her from the pain that you would experience of her not caring, of her not acting, of her being distracted from your issues, of her failing to protect you. We do everything in our power as children to maintain our parents' good opinion of us, and to do that, we must do everything within our power to maintain our good opinion of our parents. And we avoid going to them with problems which will cause them to fail us. Because that is even worse than the bullying. So, um, again, back to the question, how, how, how to break it out of it, you said confront? Well, I, you know, my personal, my personal, I mean, I, I, I don't like telling anyone what to do, so I'm not going to. It's not, it just doesn't work. But what I would say is that um, going to talk to a counselor, a good counselor, maybe even a man, might be a good idea, and not a cupped up the yin, cucked up the yin yang Swedish pseudo man, but like a real man. You know, somebody with a Viking helmet or something, right? Um, going to talk to a man or at least a good therapist about this would be very helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be a good idea to talk to your mom about this kind of stuff, but I'm not sure that I'd do it right away. I mean, I've had a little bit of a tangle with your mom. She's tough, and I'm not her kid. Right, I mean, I've been... I've got the proxy boob going on and uh, it's, it's a helmet. So, um, but yeah, journaling, keeping track of your dreams. Um, Nathaniel Brandon and, and, and John Bradshaw have a bunch of sentence completion exercises and books and so on. You've got a lot of anger. You've got a lot, in my opinion, a lot of betrayal and, and a lot of reasons to be angry because you've experienced a significant amount of betrayal. Children gain security by knowing that they are number one in their parents' lives. That their parents will move mountains and do whatever it takes to keep them safe. Dealing with bullying, well, you deal with it until it's fixed. 
And of course, I assume this was a government school, which means that the government schools have no interest in protecting the children. I mean, mean, imagine, imagine this. Imagine you go to a restaurant and get bullied by the waiter. What would happen? The waiter would be, would be fired um, because it would be bad publicity. Or- yeah, yeah. The, you you would never ever have to deal with that problem again. And of course, you should go to school. And if you have sufficient evidence of verbal abuse and emotional bullying, the child should be suspended until they've completed a course of family therapy. Right? Gone, gone, gone. But I imagine that's what a private school would do. You know, maybe if the waiter is a great waiter and completes anger management and whatever, whatever, maybe they get a second shot. But of course, bullies should be removed from schools. Of course they should. Yeah, and in public school, the victim is moved instead. Oh, yeah, the victim is blamed, of course, because it's yeah, the victim it, who's causing the problem, the, right? to another school as well. Yeah. Yeah, because, and that this is all just everybody seeking to minimize their own discomfort. Because... The child who is bullied is generally more sensitive, generally more intelligent, and generally has no strong connection with the parents, so the parents aren't going to become difficult. But you confront the bully's parents, and you know the bully's parents are bullies, so they're going to make your life difficult. And so we subsidize bullying in our society. And so in a free market environment, bullying would be dealt with very quickly. And the parents of bullies would accrue the negative consequences of the bullying because they would not be able to find a school to put their bullying children in until the bullying was fixed. And that would mean changing parental habits and family therapy. And they'd have to pay for that. And they'd have to take time off work until they could get their kid in school. And their kid would be falling behind. So they would move whatever mountains they could to to fix the problem. But right now it's all covered up and subsidized because everybody's trying to just gain five more minutes apiece, right? Yeah, exactly. No one owns the school, so it's no problem. No, they get paid either way, right? I mean, if the... the, uh, If the restaurant gets paid whether or not you get bullied... They're not going to confront the bully. Why? It just makes nobody likes to confront bullies. That's why bullies get away with shit. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you this, Gustav. Do you like being a man in Sweden? Um. Man in Sweden, there is a lot of things I don't like to be when it comes to um, specifically being a man. Um, well, we are not appreciated in any way. Um, well, you're <laughs> not, it's not just not appreciated, right? Yeah, we are privileged. That's like the yeah. non parenting thing. Aren't you, aren't you actively attacked and blamed for just about every social ill? Yeah, for instance, uh, at work, um, I. I quit that job because I sat in the same room as a hardcore feminist (laughs) and she said the only reason I had the job was because I was a white white male. (laughs) So I couldn't... um, And then at another occasion, this was before Donald Trump um, became um, um, a contender for the Republican nomination. But we were at... uh, um, We were at... We were eating lunch and his name came up and I didn't know much about him at that time, but I said, I think he's a funny person. And then she looked at me and said, so you think sexism and racism is funny? So she said and looked at me. So those two events um, um, concluded that I left the job. Uh, you can't be in, the, you have to leave environments with the, those kinds of people but for instance at, when you work um, if you're a, an employee at uh, a normal Swedish company you can't basically have an opinion that is anti-feminist um, feminist, uh, or anti um, the immigration system uh, it's very very politi- politically 
Correct. So. Well, what happens if you do? Like if you say, well, I'm not sure these migrants is a very good idea in the long run and uh, no, maybe will, too much they too will, soon. They will do it. Well, for instance, take that with, the, that with Trump. That's what they do. She called me a sexist and a racist uh, because I said I think Trump is funny. And that was before he even started his campaign. So, so is it basically abused um, if you even say anything like that? So right, and and you could get fired, right? You could, right? Yeah, or you, or like me, in my, in my case, I left be, uh, by myself because it was it was not pleasant. You can't be, uh, you can't work in the same room as a person who says the only reason you have the job is because you are a white male. You are privileged. No, no, I, I get. That. I mean, it certainly when, is tough. To even be. though. Uh, when I when I decided to quit, everyone else was uh, said I said I was one of the best that had done that work. Uh, so I was very. Good and of at course, it. if if you were to if you were to go to complain, if you were to go to complain to say that this woman is is saying that I only have a job because I'm a white male, which is offensive to me, what would happen? Uh, well, the other males are so uh, feckless, uh, so. Uh, I wouldn't want to deal with it either. So you you would end up being in trouble, probably, right? Probably because she would lie constantly, and she has yeah. no moral. She would just make stuff up, I guess. Yeah, and in any and conflict it, it, between I, the man and the feminist, the women will yeah. the, the women will flock to the feminist in general, and the men will white knight and right. Yeah, and she yeah. has, she has, because she has no moral, she can use any any tactic she wants, and sure. I would never do that. So it's if she's a victim, it's an, so she it's has no even, standards. It's an uneven battle. I yeah. can't win it. Yeah. So the only only way to live um, for for me in Sweden in the future, because I'm a student last year now, is to have my own company. Uh, my own company. And, um, yeah, you, you can't bring a penis to a state fight. I mean, it, these days it doesn't work. So yeah. th you have some significantly negative aspects to being a man in Sweden, right? Yeah, you can't have a, a, man, a man in Sweden who has uh, distinct opinions and takes space. That's very negative. That's threatening to, <laughs> to a lot of people. It's insane. So let me ask you this. Imagine, Gustav, that you are walking in the woods. Mm -hmm. And you see this feminist up there marching in her pear-shaped, comfortable shoed fashion through the woods. Let's pretend that feminists exercise. And... She is set upon by a bear. What would you do? Uh, nothing. Right. And that's why there's a migrant crisis. Because, uh, what do you mean? I'm not blaming you. Well, I'm not saying it's your fault. That's why there's a migrant crisis. Because the... Uh, I, I think you said the feminist, right? The f not yeah. a, you're not uh, just a normal person, the feminist. Yeah, because I yeah. don't want to short-circuit you by asking if your mother was being attacked by a bear, so we'll just make the other feminist the stand-in. Okay. That's why there's a migrant crisis, because the women have become so unappealing that men don't want to defend them. Yeah. Because women have become so negative, bitchy, and hostile. Or, if they're not doing it, they're standing idly by while the man gets mauled by the ninth wave feminist daemon from hell mm. that life men, men men exist to protect women men exist to protect women society survive why because men want to protect women we want them to be comfortable so we invent air conditioning we want them to be dry so we make roofs we want them to be warm so we make fire we want them to be moving comfortably so we build cars we want to keep them safe while we get our eyeballs blown out by shrapnel. 
Society exists, technology exists, comfort exists, civilization exists, art and music and movies exist. Because we want to save and please and woo and win women. And now that is uh, eroding. Well, now the women have married the state. Now women have married the state and men are their slaves. Yeah. Slaves don't fight to keep the civilization. Tax cattle don't fight to keep the farm going. Men are tragically bereft of women they love enough to save. Mm -hmm. And women can shit all over men all they want. And what they do is they erode the man's desire to protect the women. And ladies, I'll tell you this. You have been around nice men for so long that you think you can treat all men in the world this way? Let me tell you something, ladies. There are men coming to your neighborhood you won't be able to bully. And then, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. The 85 IQ uh, immigrant crisis. Yeah. Yeah, a bunch of Muslim men. They got a big bag of stones for mouthy and abusive women. And let me tell you something about stoning, ladies. Quran explicitly says, make it slow. Don't use rocks so big that the woman dies immediately. Take your time. Make it a languid exercise in slow, tortuous death. And so it is the most tragic of all circumstances. I don't know if you've ever felt this in your life, Gustav. I know I have. That nice people finish last. And Western men are really, really nice. Western, white, European men, really, really nice. Just had a long chat with a Swedish lady about this, so we're going to publish that probably next week. And don't you just hate the idea that being nice means you just get bullied and pushed around? That yeah. being nice and, and conciliatory and caring about and being sensitive, that that just sets you up as a big target to be pushed around and bullied. Well, Western men have put up with it for a little over two generations now. And what's happened is there is this village, this campsite in a very, very dangerous jungle. And men, and it has been men, men have worked very hard to build moats and to build traps and to build walls to keep the women of the camp who cannot fight the predators in the jungle to keep the women in the camp safe. And as a result of their safety and security, the women have grown lazy and abusive. And now they think that the whole world is safe. The jungle is safe. The shark-infested oceans are safe. The volcanoes are safe. The hot springs are safe. The geysers are safe. The cliff edges are safe because they've been in a safe and secure bubble of masculine security for a long time. And they're sitting on their squalid fats body behinds, munching grapes and screaming at the men and calling them assholes and patriarchs and lazy, entitled cisgender scum. Not all the women. There are a few women who are whispering it's not the way it should be, and, but most women are not doing much of anything about it, just letting the men get brutalized. And they say, we don't need men. The world is safe. Everything is safe. Why, we haven't seen a predator here in 60 years. 
haven't seen any lions or tigers. Haven't seen a single bear for 60. I think they're a myth. I don't think there are any bears out there. The only bears, the only predators are these men. And the men say, well, you know, we just built this whole thing to keep you all safe. No, you are the predators. You are the meanie pops. And I don't know. There are no predators out there. You guys are the predators. You assholes. And we better keep boys away from men. Because there's a patriarchy. Ladies, we got to keep these boys away from men. We got to break the spines of men. We got to divorce men. We got to cast them out. And the women will raise the men now. And that way, we'll be totally and completely safe. Because we won't have any warriors. We won't have anybody patrolling the outskirts. We won't have anybody maintaining the walls. We won't have anybody filling up the moats. We won't have anybody checking the traps are working. We'll have the women raise the men so we won't have any warriors. And that way, we'll be totally safe. And this is what happens generation after generation. The men are castigated, the men are snarled, the men are broken down, the men are insulted, the men are scorned, the men are broken, humiliated, abused, unprotected. But the problem is, nobody's maintaining the defenses of the camp. And the animals that prowl around keep testing the boundaries. They keep snuffling up against the fence and they keep testing the waters and they keep touching the traps gingerly to see if they're still working because they're hungry and there's some pretty pear-shaped meat in that camp. You should see they have these videos online. They're kind of funny, kind of not. And the videos are you see a little baby sitting up against the glass wall of a lion or a tiger cage. The baby's just sitting there gurgling away, usually facing away from the lion or the tiger. And the lion comes creeping up and leaps at the baby and thumps against the glass and you know, opens his mouth and is trying to eat the baby's head and is scratching and trying to get at the baby to eat it. Because I bet you that's pretty delectable for a lion. But it can't. And the reason it's funny to some degree and not god-awful and horrifying is because there's an inch or two of plexiglass between the lion and the baby, built by men. And what's happening now is the predators are breaking through the defenses. Because nobody's maintaining the defenses. We don't need it. There are no predators. The only predators are the men. And we've, it's okay because we've kept all the young men away from any of the elder men who have any memory of combat or protection. So none of the martial practices, none of the defense practices, none of the... And the women have become so unappealing that the men don't even want to save them. And here come the predators. And what do the women say? Oh, 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 okay. It's no problem. Hey, don't worry, ladies. We've treated them like shit for two generations. We've pillaged them. We've stolen their money. We've imprisoned them with false accusations. We've taken their alimony and their child support. We've divorced them. We've said they're all rapists and scum and patriarchs. But don't worry, ladies. All we'll do is we're going to shame them in defending us now. But here's the funny thing about shame. Shame doesn't work if you don't accept the premise. So when these predators coming through, and no, I'm not talking about that Nashville hockey team. When the predators come through, the women are all going to hoist themselves off their gender studies hammocks. And they're going to scream at the men, man up, protect us, save us. We need you. But they're not going to admit they need you. Actually, they probably won't even say that. A real man would, would save us. 
real men? Everything that you now need, ladies, is exactly what you have been abusing and condemning and attacking and brutalizing for the past couple of generations. And ladies, if you want to be saved, you might want to be a little bit more complimentary to men. You know, if I'm asking someone to lay down his life for me, I don't think it's wise to call him an asshole at the same time. Save me from these bad men, you bad men. Save me from these rapists, you rape culture patriarchs. No! And all that's left is bones and fat lions. And that's why there's a migrant crisis. And I apologize for insulting the lions. You wouldn't take a bullet for these people, would you? No. No. No, you wouldn't. And thus it ends. Yeah. Why would you want to protect a woman who never protected you? Why would you want to protect women who only use the security you provide to attack you? And there's only one solution. And it's not pretty. Would you like to hear the solution? Yes, of course. Now, everyone is going to take what I say next out of context. I'm going to tell you that up front. And I'm only going to presage this by saying that many of my most influential intellectual mentors have been women. All right, so I'm going to put that out up front. I'm talking in generalities. The only way to save the West at the moment is to change our perspective of the majority of women when it comes to defending society. Look, you're not a father, but if you were a father and your child was wandering onto the road, would you say, ah, oh, he'll learn his lesson? No, of course not. I would uh, run. You'd scoop so, him up. Yeah, you'd scoop him up and say, he's a child. You can't let consequences accrue to children. Because they know not what they do, right? How experienced are women in war? How experienced are women in intertribal conflicts? How experienced are women in general in the political system? I'm talking about the sum total of human evolution as opposed to the last 80 or 60 years or whatever, right? And the answer is almost none. They have almost no experience in defense, almost no experience in any of these things, right? So when it comes to things like national defense, women are children. Because the question is, for a lot of European men, and it's not just in Europe, because they say, ladies... You shit on us for two generations or let other women do it without much protest. So, you get what's coming to you. We're not going to protect you. Reap what you sow. Enjoy your new overlords. Right? You've heard these uh, sentiments, right? Yeah. Right, which is like saying to your child, well, you wandered into traffic. Enjoy being dead. Well, that's not good parenting, right? And when it comes to things like national defense and protecting 
civilization from barbarism? Women are children. There are other areas where women are fantastic and men are like children, but this particular area, which is kind of the important one at the moment, women are children. And if we say to the child who's grabbing the big pot of boiling water, oh, the third degree burns will teach him a lesson, that's bad parenting. And letting women warble on about multiculturalism and compatibility and national defense and borders and war and guns and conf I mean, it's like listening to a three-year-old tell the plot of Star Wars. They may make some funny sounds, but they're not at war. So, for European men to say, well, we'll just let the negative consequences accrue to European women and serve them right. Well, first of all, European men don't get to exist independently of European women, and if Europe goes down, it's not like the men are going to be free. But the only way that I can think that men might rouse themselves to the defense is to say, well, boys, let's, let's reason together. Let's grab a couple of testicles, shove them under a round table, and talk frankly to each other, for the hour is growing late. Boys, we made a big mistake in the West. We really did. It's terrible. We listen to women about war. We listen to women about defense. We listen to women about danger. We let the sentimentality of women overcome the multi-millennia hard-won experience of men who actually have to go to battle. Oops! We kind of let that one get away with us. You know, we wanted to please women. You know, we're Western men, so we survive because we're K-selected. We have to please women because women got to stay around to raise our kids who are more complex and need more nurturing and more parenting. And so we're, you know, we naturally have to spend towards pleasing our women. And this is what the women say they wanted. And we gave them the vote and they got took over the state and they got the welfare state and they got all this free stuff because women pay much less in taxes than men do. So for them, it was a whole bunch of free stuff and they kind of went nuts like fat kids in a candy store and we kind of let the whole thing just get away. You know, we didn't, we didn't listen to those libertarians who said you need a smaller state. We didn't listen to those anarchists who said you need no state. We didn't listen to all these people. We were inattentive in guarding the hard-won cathedrals of freedom founded on the blood of our ancestors. We kind of let women run away with it. We let our kids wander near the street. Whose fault is that? It's, Gently, it's the, parents. the men. Yeah. Now, this takes a certain amount of nutting up that is hard for most men to even conceive of. And it takes a certain perspective. Listen, women are wonderful. Women are fantastic. There's nothing to do negative towards women. But women are not biologically equipped in any animal species where there is inter intraspecies predation. The females do not guard the tribe. It's the men, it's the male monkeys who circle the tribe and, and the women are focused on raising the kids, gossiping and picking nits out of each other's ass. Worst porn ever. So, as men, you know, because we like to please women, we kind of let civilization get away from us just a little bit. And like women, because we're raised by women, we became frightened of bad words. Men regularly insult each other. And the reason that we do so is so that we remind ourselves not to be scared of bad words. Now, women need evolutionarily needed the cooperation of other women in their tribe to raise their children. And any woman who was ostracized would not have the resources necessary to raise her children. Nobody would watch her children. Her children could wander off or eat something bad or be grabbed by a lion or whatever. So bad words for women 
are like bullets for men. And so because we all ended up raised by women with single mother household, or in your case, father emotionally absent households, and with a predomination of early childhood educators who are women, we're all raised by women. And so we're all scared of bad words because we all think we have tits and fear. And woman's susceptibility to bad words is perfectly understandable from an evolutionary standpoint. But now men have become scared of bad words. Now, to be fair to men, it's bad words with the government behind them a lot of times as well. So it's more than just bad words. But this is the Donald Trump phenomenon in a nutshell. Oh, look, a guy has come along who's not scared of bad words. Who's not scared of being called All the terrible names you can think of. Mike and I did a show today. What was that number, Mike? 76.7? Yes, I think 75 or 76.7 million dollars worth of negative advertisements uh, (laughs) thrown at Trump over the course of this primary. Which makes him the male equivalent of Superman. You know Superman? The bullets just bouncing off his manly Chris Reeve prior to the horseback accident chest. So from a woman's standpoint, women throw verbal abuse at men because verbal abuse is so terrible for women. Men joke with each other about verbal abuse to remind each other that they're not bullets. So we're good, right? This is why men can have fights and have significant conflicts and then be fine a day or two later. Whereas one woman steps on another woman's toes and it's Hatfield versus McCoy's till the end of time. (laughs) And so we kind of forgot the real danger in the world, which is not the words of women, but the swords of men. Because we're raised by women, and this is why men have become so susceptible to verbal abuse, because that's how women operate. That's what you use when you're not strong. So, Donald Trump... Anti-Trump groups spent $75.7 million on 64,000 negative ads to take down Trump. This is what is incomprehensible about Trump. Is that he's a man who says, eh, people say shit, what can you do? This is what people find incomprehensible about me. It's potential that there's a negative thing or two about me somewhere out there on the interweb, somewhere out there in the tubes. I have a cause that's bigger than bad typing and, ooh, negative syllables. And Trump was very close to his father, and his father did not spank him. And his father trusted him, and he loved his father, and his father loved him. So he has the male invulnerability to harsh language. I mean, femininity run amok needs hug rooms. Right? And and has hate speech laws. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Fucking mental. When I was a kid, I don't know what the Swedish equivalent is, but I was a kid. I was always told, sticks and stones can hurt your bones, but words will never harm you. Yeah, we don't have that, I think. Well, you probably did at some point, you ex-Vikings. <laughs> A, uh, a shiv through the head <laughs> can part my hair. But um... but you said uh, uh, we would have to overthrow the patri- uh, matriarchy and go back to patriarchy. Uh, and you said that you also... No, I see, patriarchy and matriarchy to me is just a different spheres of influence. We have to go back to freedom. We let women, voters, choose security over freedom. Because Mm. women are programmed to choose security over freedom because children. Men are programmed to choose risk over security because risk has the potential within it of gaining more resources with which to get a more attractive, healthier, better mother for your children. This is why men spread widely over the IQ spectrum and women don't. As Camille Paglia said, 
the reason why there are no female Mozarts is because there are no female Jack the Rippers. Because men prefer risk to security. Because risk has the concomitant or associated rewards of having massive amounts of resources with which you can spread your seed. You know, which is why Genghis Khan, well, he went out from time to time. <laughs> yeah. And women prefer security to liberty. And these things are great. All risk is bad. All security is bad. All risk is chaos. All security is stagnation. And because we still have yet to learn the lesson that the government will always destroy society, men gave women the vote. And historically, the moment that men could, they did. Men gave women the vote. The women voted for security over freedom. The women lacked the resources to understand the basic math of debt and unfunded liabilities and just grabbed and grabbed and consumed and consumed. And society stands in a, at a precipice. Is it the fault of women? No. You give kids lots of candy, they're going to eat lots of candy. Do they care about diabetes and toxic liver and tooth decay and obesity? No. Tastes good. Right? And we gave women lots of free stuff because we gave them massive benefits with no draft and no requirement that they cover it through taxation. Free stuff. Free stuff. You know, you shake a billion dollars worth of hundred dollar bills over a poor neighborhood, is everyone then a thief? Yeah. Not really. So the wealth that accumulated and survived the wars, accumulated through the first Industrial Revolution and survived the, the two world wars, the wealth that was accumulated was handed out to women. Why? Because women wanted the vote and Western men care about being sexist. <laughs> Our downfall. <laughs> I mean, you know, go to the Middle East and you people are sexist. Yep. It's right there in the Koran. Men and women are different and men should be in charge. And we wanted to, to, to please women. Women say we want the vote, we give them the vote. Because if you say no, women shouldn't have the vote or we should not have a vote or we should not have a government. Women won't fuck you. And your genes die out. So all of the non-pleasing genes in the West died out because Western men don't dominate their women the way that most other cultures do. Western women are the most pampered creatures in existence these days. And like all pampered creatures, they have become corrupt and venal and brutal. That's what pampering does. If it's unjust. And so... Western men don't like to take stands against the preferences of Western women because case selection. <clears throat> and that's fine as long as there's not a government because it balances out. But when men hand the government over to women, my God, talk about the ring of power. We now got some sexy Saurons. They used to be sirens. Now they're Saurons going down. And it is a giant object lesson on the endless perils of organizing your society around a centralized coercive agency like the state. The state destroys all civilizations. The state destroys all genders. The state destroys all races. The state is toxicity and addiction and destruction and violence and bribery. And an uneasy, squalid sinking in quicksand, pseudo-comfort. We have yet to learn this lesson. State corrupted men. Men survived that, shrank the state, created wealth, and then bought vaginas by handing over that wealth to women. Women responded by hating men and not having children. 
Now there's no money for unfunded liabilities and all the governments that run out of money try to provoke a war. Dominoes, dominoes, dominoes. <laughs> Fuck. Fuck! We're stuck in a revolving door in a goddamn abattoir. Damn it, we were close to. Close to shrinking that motherfucker down to nothing. The Americans, so close. The smallest government possible, and I think if it had not been for slavery, they might have gotten close enough. But maybe it could have shrunk away. But slavery led to the pretense of the Civil War. Pretense of the Civil War led to a vastly expanded federal government, which led to the Federal Reserve, which led to endless wars, which led to unfunded liabilities, which led to delusion in the population and an inability to count, which led to female dominance, which led to male alienation, which led to the destruction of the family, which led to the hollowing out of demographics which led to the lie that you could now import third worlders to replace native-born Europeans, which I fear will lead to war. And oh my God, what a war it will be. It will either be brutal and short or constrained and endless. Should it come? But I'm trying to empower you here, Gustav, by saying, well, we can complain and we can say, well, let the ladies accrue. You know, if you go hunting with marinade on you and a bear attacks you, well, but if it was your child in the forest rather than this feminist, what would you do? Yeah, I would just offer myself do everything you would, to save it. You would fight. The only way to get men to fight is for men to view women as children in this area. That's the only way that men will fight, is if they view women as children. But the, but the state uh, needs to collapse, like, because like you said, the state is be behind uh, the current system now. Uh, so if, if men would, say, would revolt, they would just lose their no, jobs. This, 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 this after. Men, men have this everything not, to lose. Forget, forget that. Forget the state. This is for after. This is for what gets built after. This is for what gets built after. The most likely, well, I don't know what the odds are. If I had to put money, the most likely scenario is a clash of civilizations. And the clash of civilizations is going to be provoked by the state running out of money. So that the current system is done. Stick a fork in it, turn it over. The current system is done. Yeah. The question is what comes next? And I think a lot of men would be willing to fight if they had enthusiasm for what comes next. But there's no goddamn way men are going to fight and risk life and limb in order to return to the current feminist-led lesbian tirade gynocracy that shreds men for fun and pleasure and profit. There's simply no way any more than you'll jump in front of that bear to save the feminist who thinks you're a piece of shit on the toes of an all-female deity, right? Mm -hmm. You might fight if you want a different society to live in where you're treated with dignity and respect. You might fight for that, but you sure as shit are not going to fight to return to the status quo, are you? No. Save the feminists who hate men. Save the men marching gleefully off into battle in their panties. Come on. Ladies, in order to be saved, you have to be loved. And in order to be loved, you have to be nice. Do you understand? In order to be saved, you have to be loved. In order to be loved, you have to be nice. And if you hate men or you're indifferent to the hatred of men and the suffering of men that results from that hatred, if you're willing to kick men out of the family and bully them out of the workforce and bully them out of schools, and drug them for not being like girls. 
if you treat men like shit, well, slaves don't fight. Or at least they won't fight well. Look, everybody knows. People are saying on these comments, right? I bring this stuff up. What do the people say in the comments? Oh, well, ladies, you think you're equal to men? Why don't you strap on your tank girl halter top and go and fight whatever fight needs to be fought on you? They're not going to do that. Come on. Come on. You might as well go to arm up your kindergarten with Nerf guns and think you're going to take on the Wehrmacht. (laughs) It's not going to happen. Oh, is there a draft? Oh, drafts make me pregnant. I get inseminated by wind. The draft has made me pregnant. I guess I can't fight after all. Oh, look at that. They're not going to fight. (laughs) They're not going to. It's all a lie. G.I. Jane. Yeah, right. Men got to do 35 push-ups. Bare minimum. Women. 13. <laughs> Man, I can't even lift an RPG. I've had lots of practice lifting an RPG because I pay standing up. Jesus. They're not... <laughs> and it's just a lie. There is never money to be lost by appealing to female vanity. Nobody ever lost money by saying, well, no, we can't, we can't praise women that much. They won't believe us. <laughs> Yeah, you're just like men. You can fight just like men. Meg Ryan, excellent combat queen. (laughs) Because Lara Croft. (laughs) I mean, it's it's, it's a a comic book. It's insane. It's like going to Big Hero 6 for a physics lesson (laughs) on robotics. I mean, come on. They're not going to fight. And if you want to lose, just have them fight. Oh, well, but in Israel, no. In Israel, they don't put women on the front lines. Women can't handle the front lines. They get depressed. Women are kind of designed to make life, not take life. Women put frilly things in dollhouses. Boys like firecrackers and wasps nests. I mean, come on. They're not going to fight. I'm not trying to shame the men into fighting. God, the last thing I want to do. Shame the men into if there's going to be a fight. Or, and, and there's going to be a fight. I hope the fight is verbal. I hope the fight is just men standing up and saying, come on, ladies, wake up. I don't care if it's upsetting to you. Deal with it. You know what? Men have been called patriarchs for 60 years and evil, misogynist, chauvinistic pigs. If we can fucking deal with it and you're equal to men, you fucking deal with it. Yes. I'm sorry you're upset. Welcome to being an adult, ladies who want equality. I'm not trying to shame men into fighting because that's not going to work. You can only shame people after you respect them. But shaming people you've already shamed, all that produces is blowback, which is what we're seeing, or what I'm seeing in the comments, with all these types of videos. I'm going to shame men into fighting. But, if you only listen to men, you don't have much of a civilization. You have pizza box strewed man caves with 90 inch televisions and no vegetables. You don't want to run a society listening to men and you sure as shit don't want to run a society by by listening to women. My God. As Camille Paglia said, if women had been in charge of human development, we'd all still be living in caves. Because what, what is a woman's life throughout most of evolution? A woman gets free shit and then she gets pregnant. It's lovely. It's not a bad life. I'd like to come back with functional tits in the future. But that's not how you create a civilization. Free stuff and sperm. <laughs> Hopefully in that order. But, uh, you know, pendulum... Yeah, just swung a little bit <laughs> too far one way. And the state or you know, state never finds a happy medium, right? So, you know, men just, I know you got to fight your instincts and stop listening to women about what they say they want. I mean, it's. Well, 100 years from now, and they look back at 
this time. It must be like the craziest period in civilization. This this period, do you think so? Well, if they look back and think of us as crazy, that's because sanity won. Yeah, so hope, that's yeah, I best think hope. sanity will win, of course, I think. Why? Well, take How? the medi medieval uh, after Roman Empire fell apart. Yeah, but that was that it was, was a uh, that, no no that was a high IQ population, and the lower IQ populations were wiped out by endless rounds of famine and disease. Yeah, well, now there's enough technology to keep. Now there's enough technology to keep low IQ populations alive forever. How the fuck is that not going to? How's that going to end? There was a winnowing out of low IQ populations. That's the brutal course of European high IQ development. Is that lower IQ people who couldn't defer gratification died off, starved to death, got cooped up in cities and nailed up in quarantines during the Black Death and Black Plague, and regularly you would get the low IQ populations dying off, which is not nice and not fun, but this is why we're smarter. But now, smart people have invented enough technology and developed enough agricultural capacities and enough medical procedures that now you can have an Africa that supports 12 trillion people, apparently, and now you have a Middle East where infant mortality has dropped from 50% down to whatever, 2%. Develop that on their own that came from the smart people, the West, the technology, the capitalism. That shit is all there and it ain't going away. How are the low IQ people not going to remain the majority? Because the high IQ people gave all this shit to keep the low IQ people alive, which didn't exist before. So I wouldn't take it for granted. I don't think it's inevitable. I think we're going to have to work to maintain the fruits of an intelligent civilization. We can move uh, north, further north, where it's what to Iceland. Yeah, yeah, that's no. one question I thought Listen, about. Why, why doesn't all gonna... the why doesn't all the free market people move to Iceland? It's like three hundred thousand people living there, and then you take it over like uh, others do with voting. No, but there's weapons of mass destruction. Let's take a complete. Let's just say this is an outlandish scenario. But let's say that some terrible group that doesn't like white people gets a hold of a nuclear weapon. Why? Because white people abandon Europe. Let's just say, right? Let's say that there's a population that expands and grows to the point where they get to take over weapons of mass destruction developed and created by groups significantly superior to them in intellect as a whole. Well, they'll just say to Iceland, surrender or we bomb you. Oops, retreat didn't work. Anti-missile defense. I'm sorry? Anti-missile defense. You take all the missiles with you? No, anti-missile defense. You can shoot down the missiles while the... Uh, you really think that's got more of a chance to be developed in a fleeing, hungry, starving population? You, re you really <sighs> want to put your odds on that? And the fight is still verbal. That's the beautiful thing about it. Mm -hmm. The fight is still verbal. And all we have to do is remember that men aren't supposed to be broken by words. We can be broken by bullets. We're not supposed to be broken by words. And we have to have the courage to stand up and speak our minds. Because if we don't have that, it might, all, it might as well already be a dictatorship. Yeah. A dictatorship, as I've characterized it before. Yeah, one of the biggest biggest limits now, I think, uh, is because the truth is so uh, painful now. It takes so much uh, effort to um, communicate it to people. But now we're back to your mom. I didn't tell her I was bullied because it would be painful to her. Yeah, but uh, that's a general universal instinct. To, uh, not only that, but... No. No. No, you, you keep trying to excuse your mother by creating it's Sweden and right and universals and it's instinct to know. There are lots of children who, when they're in trouble, they go to their moms and their moms move heaven and earth to help them. Yeah. And listen, you are a young man, which means that... Given the way the demographics work, you're not going to be very old before you're in the minority in your own country. 
in the country that your ancestors fought, bled, and died to create and sustain. Yes. So this uh, idea uh, will uh, just cut and run, or this idea that it's, you know, I mean, I wouldn't suggest it. But sorry, go ahead. Yeah, because the, the future looks very grim, especially in Sweden, with the demographics. Uh, I only see some options. Either is every day, listen, because of the demographics, every day you don't act, every day you don't speak up, every day you don't something, you don't say something. Whites get weaker and non-whites get stronger. I mean, I'm just giving you the basic facts. They grow, you decline. They swell, you diminish. So there's no later, because later is worse. So if you're going to demand political action from people every day you don't, if you're going to try and get your government to do something every day you don't, you are in a more losing position. Every day you delay is a contribution to your loss. I need people in Europe to panic, to freak out, to be sleepless. Deferral is demise. You understand? Yeah. Just numerically. Deferral is demise. Because we know this historically that when these groups get to be a majority, they will do what they want to do, which is to have their kind of country. That ain't your kind of country. It's been 60 so far. I don't think they're done. And every day, you delay and you defer. It raises your odds of failing. Well, moving to Norway, do you think that's still not right to think about that? But instead, uh, for instance... Uh, Why don't you try to save your own country first? If your first instinct is to run, you've already lost. Well, take Ayn Rand. Uh, her father, he was optimistic about when the takeover happened, uh, that it would collapse, which it didn't. It lost your takeover first. has not happened. Right? The, we're talking like 20 years before the communist revolution or 10 years, right? The takeover hasn't happened. Listen, if, she, if, if, you, if you're under Sharia law, you have my permission to flee. Mm. You ain't there. Yeah, All right. I'm going to move on to the next caller, but you. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Time and attention in this call. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for calling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.